We're talking about um, optimization for, for, for SaaS monetization and uh, would love to talk a little bit about um, um, metrics, kind of how to define the product and then uh, the monetization piece. But, but first of all, perhaps um, a little bit about yourself, former entrepreneur, uh, started Evite, sold it to Ticketmaster uh, and now since I think uh, 2009 at SurveyMonkey. Um, tell us very quickly about a little bit of background of your, about yourself and kind of survey monkey so we, we get to start here. Great. Um, well, yeah, thanks everybody for being here. Um, survey monkey, hopefully most of you have taken a survey. We send about three million surveys a day. Um, and we really are trying to help users, enable our users to help make better decisions with data. Um, and so that's our business mission. Um, I've been there, as you said, since for the last five and a half years. And for me, it's just a fantastic product combined with a great team and just continued. We've grown from 20 people to 520 in the last five years. So when you, when you think about, I mean, it all starts with kind of measuring uh, success and the metrics um, to, to look at your, your, um, your company, your product. So high level, kind of what are the, the two, three, four most important metrics you look at every day? Great. Um, so our business is freemium. So it's really driven by the fact that we have a set of free customers who um, kind of have a viral component that then drives our customers to being pay paying customers. Um, and so for us, it's about really four key metrics. It's the number of users that we get from being free users into paying customers, um, the number of users, period, that we can get to actually engage and deploy surveys. So what is that engagement metric that's really important? Um, churn, so how many users stay with you and for how long. Um, and, and then in terms of the um, pa uh, pricing side, it's how do you optimize the price or package that you can get that consumer to purchase. So do you think SurveyMonkey is kind of the biggest, most successful freemium company in the world? Um, I don't know if we're the biggest or successful. We are definitely one of the first. Um, the company started in 1999 and was pretty much one of the first freemium models out there. It started that way, launched that way. So, as you said, like SurveyMonkey been around for, for quite some time. You know, the, the feature set feels pretty complete, pretty mature. So wh where do you take the product from here? Kind of what is the, the bigger product vision? Absolutely. So um, with SurveyMonkey, what our whole kind of business was, was giving people access to data and decisions that they could never have before. If, if people wanted to collect qualitative data, it was really a matter of paper, pencil, um, and, and we were able to disrupt that and give people a solution for a reasonable price. Now what we're trying to do is really take our platform to the next level and democratize that same access to data. So we um, launched more recently the ability, as an example, for comparative data. So you can run your um, you know, customer net promoter score. You can look at, um, you don't know if 12 is good, is 20 good, is, is 30 good in terms of your score. Well, you need to be able to compare that to other people like you. Um, traditionally, that was very expensive. And our whole goal and mission is using our scale to democratize access. What, what role does mobile play in this, this, this area? I mean, you know, for, for a lot of incumbents, and you would say if SurveyMonkey is an incumbent, kind of mobile is sometimes a disruptor, sometimes just a complement to your, to your business. So I think that any business that is um, in today's world, and especially any business that's global, we do about 50% um, of our traffic is global, you have to think about mobile. Um, and it's really, you know, I break our mobile strategy into two sides. One is... Um, you know, for us, it's about taking the survey. So if that's about 30% of our traffic already is people who are doing that on a mobile device. Um, and then there's the stuff where you're asking a user to do more work, which in our case, it's creating a survey, understanding, analyzing that data. Um, in those cases, like we found you need to do that in the app environment versus just be optimized on the mobile web because it is, it's harder to make that work in a really great way on mobile web. Um, and trying to simplify what that experience is that somebody's trying to do in the app. So building a SaaS product that, that monetizes well kind of starts with that big question of 
how many resources should I put on the, the big bold bets versus the incremental improvements? And, and kind of very tactically, how, how do you do it? How do you think around that, that trade-off on a daily basis? So I think that a bunch of people covered that this morning as well in terms of on the growth hacking side. So I do think that it is very important that it's an explicit decision around we are going to take these engineers or these resources and put them on trying to optimize the funnel, optimize my metrics, and take these resources and say we're going to make these longer term bets. Because otherwise what happens is you tend to actually leave one or, one or the other out. And it depends really on sort of the inclination of your product lead or your CEO, which one you're going to leave out. Yeah. Um, another trade-off in product development is always you kind know, of coming up with the, the product idea and kind of how, how to optimize a product. And, and the, the one approach that, that a lot of people prefer is kind of qualitative interviews mm -hmm. and kind of just trying to understand the, the customer need on a very granular basis. Um, the other one is just relying much more on A-B testing and kind of the, the quantitative approach. So mm -hmm. how, how do you do that at, at, at SurveyMonkey? Is it a mix? Is it one, one or the other? Right. So, um, I mean, obviously we have a, a pretty good product for doing the qualitative side, but we are a business that runs very much on A-B testing as well. So we are constantly A-B testing. It is, there's no week where we will not have a test running. Um, but we try to be smart about combining the qualitative data and the quantitative data. So one example is um, after people check out, we have a survey where we ask people, what were the features that drove you to buy? Um, and we take that qualitative data, figure out those features, and try then A-B testing which features to put on the pricing page. And so, it's, you know, from my perspective, you, you can't really qualitatively test as well your homepage, your checkout, your pricing. I mean, that stuff you need to A-B test. Nobody's going to say, oh, yeah, I want to pay you more. But it's like, how can I shift you into, pay, into getting you to pay more? But if you start thinking about any of your application experiences, again, where you're trying to get user to do work, it's really important that you're testing that user experience design. You're getting that qualitative feedback about how easy was this experience for you, how did you get through it. Um, you know, we do A-B testing there as well, but it, it really then is combining that explicit and implicit data. So, so how many tests do you run at, at any stage or per year? And, and how many of those actually then work out? Um, I would say we probably are running a dozen tests at any time, and that really depends on traffic. So when, when I was at Evite and it was a much smaller company we were just building, you'd be running one A-B test at any time because you want to get that answer faster. And as your traffic starts to grow, you can run more and more tests simultaneously. Um, as far as the fail rate, I mean, I would say we probably fail more often than we succeed, um, and, but you know, probably we succeed 30% of the time. Ever had an example where it kind of got Trump the, the A-B test, or is it a rule in a company like data, data trumps, trumps instinct? Data trumps. Um, <laughs> data will trump. I mean, if two are equal, then gut can go. <laughs> um, and, and any specific tools you're using? Is it, is it all in-house built? Do you use you know, tools like no, Optimizely? We, yeah, we do. We actually use both two, two tools for A-B testing. We use Optimizely for our logged out site experience for more static content. And we actually use a product called SiteSpect, um, which is a bit more expensive. So it's kind of a little bit more difficult for startups. But um, it actually sits within your network. And so the advantage is it's not doing that redirect. And so there's no delay. And so when, you're, when we were trying to serve global traffic, we were finding that delay meant that our tests were actually performing worse than the control. Um, and I know Optimizely's done stuff to try to improve that as well. But we, we, we do use two solutions. So let's switch to, uh, to monetization. Um, SurveyMonkey has 20 million users, um, some of them free, some of them paid. Can you tell us the share between free and paid? <laughs> so I will not tell the exact share of free and paid users. <laughs> that, is, that is private information. But we, what I can say is that in terms of our free users, on average, about 4 to 9% of them, depending on marketing channel, convert to becoming a paying user. And again, for us, then there's also another stream of monetization coming from returning users and that recurring side. Um, but in terms of, you know, if you look at a lot of sort of freemium models, that is a pretty good range for you to aim for. And, and do most users also in the enterprise have kind of the same path to from, from free to paid? So there's always, they try it out for free and then they switch to paid? or you know, do you have a complete channel for, for enterprise where you don't go directly to paid? 
So even in our non-enterprise, but even our self-serve model, we have a direct-to-paid funnel, and it represents about 10 to 15% of our traffic. And so that is generally where somebody has done the research in your logged out site, knows that they need it, and will go right to the paying. Um, and we've done you know, lots, of it, lots of A-B tests and actually have found on our, on our particular model, having both a buy now, paying button, and sign up free on our homepage, we're having two calls to action, which is frankly against what you would think. Uh, has outperformed quite a bit because there is that direct to paid audience that wants to buy right away and you want to make that as easy as possible. So, you know, the, the, the playbook that you've, uh, you've kind of played on for the last little while is, is the traditional one for, for startups. Like you, you start in a long tail with the small guys, with the mm -hmm. SMBs and go up to, to the enterprise. Can you, can you take us a little bit through like how long did it take to kind of get to the next level, you know, starting from the small guys and then ending up at a real enterprise solution. And are you done yet in terms of uh, the enterprise? Do you think you can get go, go even higher? Um, so I think in, the, in today's market, you know, you end up having a few users potentially in the enterprise right from the beginning. So it's really a matter of, it's not in my mind a matter of, are you targeting Fortune 500 or targeting the SMB or the long tail? It's what's your sales strategy? So is it going to be a self-serve business at a probably lower average order value? Or are you talking about having a higher price where you're going to either have an inside sales or even an outside sales? And that really is more tied to pricing and what margin you can keep. And so we've been for the last... Uh, you know, from we we had only started a sales team effort about two years ago. So for 13 years, the business was a completely self-serve driven business with a um, you know lower priced average order value. Um, and what we saw was there was a pretty pretty good opportunity to add some advanced feature sets, create more solution sales where we could start selling into the enterprise at a higher order value of between five to 20k versus you know in the hundreds of dollars. Why, why, so long, why wait so long for, for the enterprise? It's just yeah, there was too much opportunity on the SMB side? Or? Um, so again, you know, our business was a little bit unique. We had an entrepreneur who had the business um, for 10 years, didn't take any funding. And then in 2009, there was, um, you know, he sold most of his share and we started building a team. Um, and so we, as I mentioned, we grew from 20 people to 500. And, you know, to build out an enterprise strategy with a sales team just takes time and takes people. And so, um, you know, it, for us, it was more of a business evolution um, to get there uh, versus it's not necessarily something that we wouldn't have done earlier. That said, I, I think that trying to do both massive self-serve and sales driven as a startup at the same time is, would be very difficult. What are the kind of, kind of some of the most important uh, lessons you learned from kind of running a freemium model? I mean, it's, it's still, you know, I think in, in the last five or six years, we've seen many startups kind of starting out, but it's still pretty unique as, as a model mm -hmm. in, in the software world. So I'd say a few things. One is, is that when you're trying to make the decision of what should be free versus what should be paid, if there's anything that is driving the virality of your business, keep it free. So like it is very important if you're seeing anything that's driving usage to keep that free because you want to keep, as somebody said, that flywheel going. Um, and when you, the, the second thing we've learned is that for, for, to try to get people to pay, we've seen, we saw a pretty big conversion lift if we gave people access to either try those features or at least see how those features work. So rather than just putting up like a harsh paywall right away, it's saying see what you can do. So an example is, is you know, to, to make, in our case, the survey look and feel like, like your brand, it has to, you have to pay. But it's like we let you theme it, we let you try it out, see how to make it work. But then when you go to send it, we're saying, hey, you've used paid features, would you like to deactivate them or upgrade now? But the more you can get users sort of into the funnel using the product, um, you know, the better off you're going to be from a conversion perspective. And then I'd say the, the third big lesson we've learned is around international. Um, so as I mentioned, international is, is you know, I, when I got here five years ago, it was about 5 to 10% of the business, and now it's, it's almost 50%, is that how you optimize the pricing and the packaging is very, has to be market by market. Um, and so whether we show monthly plans or annual plans, what the uh, how much we can charge, price elasticity is very, very different by markets. You can't assume you can take U.S. and Canadian prices and apply them to other markets. So how do you test for, for pricing? Uh, we, we just test prices. So we, you know, well, we constantly have price tests running. 
Um, you know, you if a user, we're always fair to users, so if a user has seen multiple prices, then um, because they have different devices and so, or something like that, we try to make it persistent on the user level, but we will give them the honor of the lower price, but we, we just test it. Any, uh, you know, kind of, does it sometimes get out that somebody got a very good price and it's, it's not a permanent one? Is that is that any concern or these tests are so small and closed that nobody really kind of talks about it? I mean, again, you're... We haven't really had that much issue, you know, even if it's a $10, $20, $100, $200 difference, you know, in terms of the different packages, you know, you're, you're not seeing it again. I think the key is if a customer does say, hey, I, I saw a lower price, you have to honor that. You have to make sure that you're, you're being fair to that customer that's reached out. So we talked about, you know, kind of one, one of the key success factors of your business, kind of moving as many people from free um, to paid, and you, you, you talked about kind of how to make kind of paid features accessible to, to, these, to these users. Is there any concern around bait and switch? Like they get really deep down into the product experience and then suddenly they realize they have to pay or? So uh, to be cl clear, we very much, as soon as they use the feature, we tell them this is a paying feature. So it's marked in pretty bright yellow <laughs> so that they know it's a paying feature, but we still give them access to trying it. So I think it is very important that you're giving them some visual indication or some more visual than even copy to say that it's a paying feature so that th that th they don't feel bait and switched at the end. Um, but I think it's just still getting them to see the power of the feature and how good it is is, is partly what's been important. And, and on, the, on, on the pricing, kind of how do you think around pricing for individual features versus bundling features? Is that a so, big discussion? Um, it has been a little bit. I mean, I think the issue is is that if you really try to get people to constantly a la carte and basically, you know, nickel and dime them, it's very difficult in a self-serve model versus if you're bundling and packaging features together and packages and trying to move people from a free plan to, you know, basic plan into a higher level paying plan, but you're bundling things together, you have a much better chance of sort of getting them to make that purchase decision because there is less choice. I and mean, we've consistently found like having three packages is is the best and taking because people will tend towards the middle one you know so so versus try, trying to constantly say here's pay us another 50 bucks pay us another another 80 bucks just just in in terms of ranges when you think about arpu at the very beginning mm -hmm. of of serving monkey to today um, kind of what impact has been from just moving to the enterprise and, and what impact has been just, you know, feature uh, optimization and kind of bro broader features? I mean, just, just very roughly. Um, I would say most of it to date has been moving by adding higher end packages and, and optimizing prices by market um, because we've only been sort of selling actively in enterprises for the last year. If I look at the future growth, it'll be more based on the, the enterprise sales growth. So let's talk a little, little bit about the future. Um, <laughs> what what is the, the kind of the, the biggest challenge for for Survey Monkey? The biggest challenge, yeah. um, you know, I think for for us the in in the biggest challenge for us, and I think this is something similar that's probably akin to startups is is we have a lot of opportunity. We we have people who use us across every single category, um, whether that's patient healthcare, whether that that's parent feedback education, employee SAC, customer SAC, and you can't really, as you start selling from an enterprise level, start targeting all the different personas and all the different buyers. And so part of what we have had to do is figure out what is our focus and how do you make sure that you don't overextend yourself when you're starting to get into these new businesses. So even as you're doing a new business within a, you know, a medium-sized company, you still have to keep that same focus, iterate, test, fail fast. Um, and that's the same thing, which you know, from a, from when you're doing a startup, you have to think about. So, how do you get the company to focus as a leader, kind of, and how do you manage that process of many, many opportunities to the two or three you should go after? Um, so, I mean, again, it, it is a lot of qualitative um, and quantitative. So it's starting to understand, talk to customers as much as possible, do product market validation, survey customers, obviously, see what, what audiences are the most ripe that you can sort of iterate on the fastest, um, as well as obviously looking at the quantitative side of what's the market opportunity. And then in terms of 
communicating that to the team, it's being able to lay that out in a clear narrative and a clear story and communicating it over and over and over again as a leader. I mean, we try to communicate our business strategy to the team at least once a quarter, if not once every month. And it, and you as a leader feel repetitive, but there's, there's new people. It's like people, it constantly sinks into people differently. I think it's, it's one of the most important lessons that I learned as an entrepreneur, <laughs> uh, former entrepreneur, kind of be, being almost repetitive and you can't hear yourself anymore talking about the same thing. But you know, the team often hasn't heard it often enough or forgot about the focus. So I think reminding everybody, including the board, um, to, to always think about uh, kind of yeah, reminding them of the focus and the, the, um, the, the, the priorities is, is super important and, and tough to do as a leader. Definitely. So talking sure. about the... The single most opportunity you had for, for ServerMonkey? The single, single most important opportunity for ServerMonkey? Um, I think, again, for us, the, the, the opportunity, one of the opportunities, one opportunity I'm most excited about is providing the comparative data to users at a reasonable price. So, again, if you're running customer sat, employee sat, it's being able to see that comparison and how you compare for $800 versus seeing it for $30,000, $100,000, access schools, education, never had access to get comparative data. Pay, do, small doctor's office never had access. It's enabling people to have access to decisions they couldn't make prior. Could it be ultimately kind of a market research network? Potentially, um, potentially, as far as you know, we see market research as as, as a higher end. We, we are really trying to focus on letting users do it themselves in a market where people haven't haven't had access to the research prior. Perfect. Appreciate you coming out, <laughs> and uh, thanks to Selena. Thank you, Boris.